So welcome to this week's uh, media briefing, which was on the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, 70 years on the throne, Britain's longest serving monarch and, and nearly um, the longest serving monarch in history with Louis XIV at 72 years, the record to beat. So during this uh, reign, it's been a time of extraordinary social change and technological innovation. And in all the plaudits that we'll hear and the history that will be acknowledged in the next few days and weeks, it's her constitutional role in relation to faith and her own personal commitment, which we're going to look at today. And joining us on the panel are Catherine Pepinster, former editor of the Tablet, journalist and author, um, Stephen Bates, the former royal and religion correspondent of The Guardian, Professor Ian Bradley, Emeritus Professor of Cultural and Spiritual History at the University of St Andrews, and Rabbi Jonathan Remain, who um, has written extensively on the Royals, new Prince Philip Well, and uh, joins us as, as Rabbi of the Maidenhead Synagogue. So when we come to each panel, panel member, you can tell us about the book that you've written, and by all means put the information in the chat box. But Catherine, as the most recent author, I wonder if we could start with you. So your book, Defenders of the Faith, is to be published shortly um, in, in June, soon after the Jubilee. And I wonder if I could ask you, first of all, to explain the title, Defender of the Faith, Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Can you just tell us what that means? What does it mean to have the monarch as Defender of the Faith? The, these two titles are often mentioned at the same time, uh, but they are two different things. So both of, both of them are related to the history of this country and uh, to the Tudor period. The, the, the title Defender of the Faith has been held by the monarchs of this country for 500 years, uh, first given to Henry VIII in 1521, uh, when he was uh, on good terms with the Pope of the time, uh, who uh, praised Henry for his uh, rebuttal of the teachings of Martin Luther and wrote a book about the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church and Pope Leo then gave him the title Defender of the Faith as thanks for that. Uh, Henry clung on to that after he broke away with, uh, from Rome and founded the Church of England. Uh, when he founded the Church of England, he was known as Supreme Head of the Church of England, but his daughter Elizabeth I thought that um, this uh, perhaps suggested that the, um, the um, the head of the church was no longer uh, Jesus Christ, so that wasn't good to suggest that, so it was changed to Supreme Governor. Uh, that role is um, uh, a constitutional role. Um, it it, it uh, shows the extent to which the, uh, the, the monarchy, um, the church and the state in this country are intertwined. Um, it is the, the Church of England is the national church, the established church, and the head of state is, is, is effectively ahead of it too. Um, but although um, the Queen is called Supreme Governor, um, it's not a, a actual kind of day to day governance or management. It, it is um, a position um, that there is a certain involvement um, with, with the church. Um, she uh, consults with um, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, she doesn't see an Archbishop of Canterbury as frequently as she does the Prime Minister, but there is there is a certain similarity in the contact. Um, she will uh, address General Synod, although her place was taken by Prince Edward most recently. And when she speaks to General Synod, it, it's much more of a, almost like a kind of sermon, much more so than, than, than the Christmas message she gives to the the general public, um, it, it has a more theological content. So that indicates that she's very involved with the Church of England, but she leaves actually running it to um, the bishops. Um, what about the appointment of, of bishops? Um, is it just a, a, um, a role in a title only that she appoints the bishops? This is very much left to, to, to others to do, but I think there have been occasions when She's, um, she's, she's indicated perhaps certain um, interest in some, um, but I don't think she really has that influence. Where, where, she, where she does have a great deal of influence is in the appointment of the Dean of Windsor. Um, and, and over the years, she and 
Prince Philip often noted individuals that they rather admired and indicated they would like that particular person to, to be appointed. And, and the Dean of Windsor is a very important figure in her life. Um, while, while she may um, uh, consult and talk to the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury is not a spiritual shoulder to lean on. Um, that is more a role for the Dean of Windsor. Can I move now to Professor Ian Bradley? Um, um, Ian, you wrote a book, God Save the Queen, The Spiritual Heart of the Monarchy, which has been republished several times, hitting various jubilees as they've uh, come along the tracks. Uh, you argue that the sacred stands at the heart of the monarchy. Can you just explain what you mean by that? Yes, the monarch is anointed um, following the precedent of Old Testament kings. Um, and indeed the words, famous words set by Handel, of course, Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet, anointed Solomon king occur in every coronation service. So there's a sense that like a priest, the monarch is set apart, consecrated. The queen herself has a huge sense of this. So yes, she uh, was of course instructed in this before the coronation, and uh, you've only got to look at, at diaries and accounts of meetings she had with um, the Archbishop of Canterbury and others before the coronation to see how seriously she was briefed on it. And of course, she herself takes it very seriously. She sees herself as having been anointed, having been called apart. Um, it's, it's part of her very strong faith <coughs> inculcated in her partly by her father, George VI, who had a very strong, clear, simple faith, and also hugely reinforced by her husband, the impact of the late Prince Philip's own faith on the Queen um, has been enormous. And um, uh, I mean, we'll probably get on to the Christmas broadcast later, and, and Catherine mentioned it, but he, he was a key figure in getting her to speak much more about her own faith. So yes, that sense of the spiritual heart of monarchy deriving directly from um, Old Testament models of monarchy, and of course, to some extent, also New Testament models of the servant king, Jesus as the servant king, which has been a very dominant theme in the, in the queen's, queen's life. You're speaking as though you've had conversations with her yourself and you know about her spiritual path and uh, the serious way in which she takes her faith. Have you spoken to her? I have, although I could not say anything, obviously, that, that uh, has passed in conversation between us, but, but I have, yes, and, and uh, also a great deal to the late Duke of Edinburgh, who, um, with whom I've had quite considerable theological conversations, but yes, but I think it's clear uh, to everyone um, her, her strong faith, and, and naturally it's something that she is, to some extent, reticent about and, and, and keeps to herself. She's not a demonstrative person, but I think anyone who does in Encounter as, as I've had the privilege of doing so is is extremely aware of the depth of her faith and also her knowledge of the church. I mean, Catherine's mentioned the fact that she has presided over almost every uh, general synod of the Church of England. Uh, she is also for us in the Church of Scotland. She's not our supreme governor, but she's a very valued member of the Church of Scotland. She has herself and other members of the royal family been the Lord High Commissioner who is appointed by the Queen. She's incredibly well up on um, the affairs of the major churches, um, not just the, the two established churches, but, but the Roman Catholic Church, the uh, nonconformist churches. And of course, increasingly, she's interested, very interested in other faith groups. And, and one of the marks of her reign and her spiritual leadership, I would say, of the country, of course, has been her engagement with faith groups right across the, the, the spectrum of belief. Mm. Can I bring in Jonathan Romain then at, at this point, Rabbi uh, Jonathan Romain from Maidenhead Synagogue. We, we've heard a lot there about the way that she uses the, the Dean of Windsor as a, as a pastor. We've heard a lot about her spiritual life and conversations between her um, and with her husband as well. Uh, from what you know about the Queen, you're up, up the road in, in Maidenhead and your various conversations um, and involvement in think tanks. Does that resonate with you? That um, Have you spoken to her? Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you know about her spiritual path? As I'm the rabbi in Maidenhead, I'm her local rabbi, so to speak, uh, just down the road from her. And really everything that uh, both Catherine and Ian have said, I, I, I would echo. Clearly, she is a person of great faith. 
Um, and, and what's interesting is that on the one hand, despite being an incredible role model uh, as a person of faith and the power of faith, and which has no doubt helped her uh, in, in, in what's quite a difficult job. Um, uh, and yet at the same time, she hasn't been able to sort of uh, halt the decline of, of, the, of the Church of England in terms of numbers. So it's a curious thing because I think everyone would say that she is much admired and is a really good example of a person of faith. Um, but her influence in terms of the faith of the country um, is different. Uh, but what's also true is that um, despite being staunchly attached to her own church, um, she's certainly been very generous in terms of outreach uh, to, to other faiths. Um, in fact, I think in the very first year of her reign, she became patron of the CCJ, the Council of Christians and Jews, and as was intimated already uh, in uh, Christmas messages, have been very notable how they've becoming increasingly uh, uh, referring to multi-faith Britain um, and all sorts of references to uh, uh, the Muslim or Hindu community, or, or I remember one Christmas message was about the, the sacred text of the Jews. So she's very much brought that to the fore um, and, uh, and has encouraged it. And of course, the Church of England itself has led the way really in interfaith dialogue and certainly from a non-Christian perspective um, her reign has really been a golden era of interfaith dialogue uh, and um, that's been just one of the big religious stories of the last uh, 70 years the flourishing of interfaith harmony and she's given that her endorsement and encouragement. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, how well you know her the royal family and your engagement with them through various think tanks and so forth? Well, I've met all of them. Um, I, I wouldn't say I had deep knowledge of any one of them, um, except perhaps a little bit about Prince Philip, who also, of course, was a person of great faith. Um, in fact, so much so that I, I, uh, having spoken to a number of people who had to preach in front of him, always found it a daunting experience because he always listened so intently to the sermon and they knew that immediately after the service, they will be quizzed, you know, uh, him saying, well, what do you mean by, or well, when you said X, Y, and Z, what, what does that signify? So he was really intently interested uh, and yet also very much open to uh, the other faiths in Britain, uh, not knowledgeable about them, not just the, the major faiths, but also the, um, what's often ignored, the differences within each faith and the different denominations. Uh, I remember he came to the uh, Sternberg Centre, that's the headquarters of Reformed Judaism in North London, and he was given a tour and uh, someone told him, oh, we do a lot of um, uh, work between uh, Jews and Christians and uh, try and harmonise them. And he said, well, that's all very well, but do you do work between Jews and Jews? <laughs> well aware of some of the little differences and the niggles that we have within each faith as well as uh, between each faith. So what the, the picture you're painting is, is of a continual conversation between the royal family and, and people of faith, is, is that right? Yes, uh, and Princess Margaret, for instance, came to our synagogue, um, uh, Prince Edward, when we had a new uh, building, he opened it, um, and I'm sure, and I know that all, all the members of the royal family have, have uh, been to uh, uh, other faith groups as well, and they just see that as an important part of the structure of Britain, um, as well as going to factories and daycare centres and, and so forth. So religion is certainly one of the key components, they would see, of, of what makes Britain Britain. Thank you, Jonathan. I'll move to, to Stephen Bates and um, also just say to everyone, if you have questions for the panel, please put it in the chat box. Uh, we'll engage in a discussion. Um, so, Stephen, you were the religious affairs correspondent, religion editor, whatever the title at The Guardian, but also the royal correspondent, which may surprise some that The Guardian um, even had such a title on its staff. I was appointed as a pragmatic move by The Guardian, I think, because um, they needed someone to follow up those, those the royal stories in those papers of records, such as the News of the World and um, the People every Sunday. Um, yes, The Guardian, as a, a Republican-leaning paper, uh, still thought um, the royal family were an important institution in this country and deserved serious coverage. So. Um, uh, I was uh, the person standing nearest um, the editorial throne at the time, and um, uh, I, it, I was deputed to do it as a sort of church and state correspondent, I suppose, because uh, I was already covering uh, religious affairs for them. And um, the two sort of constitutional uh, uh, poles of the country were, um, were thought appropriate, and indeed they were. 
just remind us of the years that you did that. It was the early 2000s? Yeah, I covered uh, religion for about seven years and um, uh, the religious, uh, the royal title stuck to me until I took early retirement from The Guardian 10 years ago. Just tell us something about the intersection of those two roles that you had, religion and, um, and the royals during that time. Um, were there any uh, clashes, disagreements, arguments that you reported on? Between church and state or between, between, um, between editorial and comment and the Guardian? Well, well, that as well, but church and state is what I had in mind. <laughs> right, OK. Um, yeah, well, there were sort of um, occasional underlying niggles, but by and large, um, the uh, the government of the day, um, my was I was mainly covering Labour governments, of course, um, was pretty respectful to the royal family. This was the days of Blair and Brown. Um, I'm sure it would have been different had uh, Jeremy Corbyn ever got remotely close to power. Um, but uh, uh, yes, uh, I mean the Queen has had um, I think now 14 prime ministers. The uh, 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 oldest, Sir Winston Churchill, was born in 1874, and um, Boris Johnson was born in 1964. So, uh, and he's not quite the youngest. I think Cameron was younger than him. But um, she's had to deal not only with uh, half a dozen or so archbishops of Canterbury, and she's met um, probably four or five popes, but uh, 14 different um, prime ministerial perspectives. Um, and prime ministerial backgrounds, although most of them have been to public schools of one sort and another, um, they uh, have grown, I think, pretty appreciative of the fact that this is a person with huge experience. I can think of no other world leader, possibly since um, Louis XIV, who's had a greater knowledge or, and the length of experience of uh constitution and world events and uh certainly louis the 14th never met half as many people as um uh, queen elizabeth ii has done so you, your book uh just to to credit it for a moment royalty inc britain's best known brand uh, i'm just wondering uh having written that how you respond to what ian bradley was saying that the sacred stands at the heart of the royal family w would you agree Yes, I think it's a very important element. Indeed, indeed, one of the chapters in my book was um, uh, about the Queen and her faith and uh, the uh, part it played in her life and in the life of her as the monarch. Um, so uh, I think it is very central to her worldview and um, her, her very sense of duty and, um, uh, uh, and spiritual authority. Can I just uh, throw the question open then to the panel, perhaps Catherine first, if you'd like to come in, how you, um, how you would perhaps interpret or explain the, the continuing enduring popularity of the monarchy in this country, um, and that how the Queen's perhaps sense of service and the way that she has uh, dealt with the role in those 70 years has, has uh, contributed to the fact that we still have a monarchy now, despite all the social changes and technological innovations. Well, I think there's two things going on in terms of the, the attitude of people in this country to the monarchy. There, there are a great number of people who, who I think have an interest in it uh, uh, as, a, as a soap opera, as a drama. Um, and their, their interest is in um, the, the, roy the, the younger royals um, who provide um, what people like to call clickbait. Um, they're interested in their fashions, in their dramas, in their fallings out, etc. But I think separate from that, and, and sometimes even the same people have this point of view, that separate from that is, is the Queen, who, who seems, uh, um, apart from moments such as when she's accompanied by Prince Andrew at his father's remembrance of, is mostly the Queen manages to stay out of that. And I think the, the attitude towards her is is much more about um, seeing her as, as somebody who represents certain um, stability for this country, certain continuity um, values, I think, as well. I, I, even those who might not share her, her particular 
um, quite intense faith can recognize that she stands she stands for certain for, for something um, that she represents this country um, the days when um, people used to complain about um, the royals not doing enough work that seems to have slightly dissipated um, and and now um, given how old she is there is there's be more admiration for um, the work she continues to do. Um, she, I mean, if we look back at her 70 years, it's not, it's not been, you know, an entirely charmed reign. There have been times when she's gone in and out of favour. But on, on the whole, um, she's the main popular. She's probably at one of her popularity peaks at the moment. But I do think people make this division between um, the family which provides certain kind of entertainment for a lot of people and and the monarch herself absolutely agreeing with that i think there's a key distinction between the institution of monarchy and its popularity and the popularity of of a particular monarch and there are big questions i think about what happens when the Queen dies. Uh, I mean, on the whole, polls have fairly consistently suggested about 65 to 70% of the British population being very happy with, with monarchy. We are, and that is high by European standards. Norway also has a very consistently high uh, polling for, for monarchy. The Scandinavian monarchies are popular, of course, very different kinds of monarchy from ours, more secular in a sense and more slim, slim line. But, um, basically uh, about two thirds plus of the population supports the monarchy. There is, I think, a, a demographic difference. I, I mean, I absolutely agree with Catherine about the fact that for a lot of people, uh, the monarchy is a soap opera. Uh, we're in the cult of, of celebrities. And, and for many people, Meghan, Harry, the late Diana particularly, were, were primarily celebs. That if you look at, at as you'd expect, uh, the over 65s are a great deal more affirmative of, of monarchy than uh, the, the under 40s. Um, and, and this obviously raises questions for the future. I mean, younger people are less committed to the idea of monarchy and certainly less committed to the idea of monarchy having a kind of sacred uh, quality. But, but as I say, overall, popularity for monarchy, it's, it's, it's obviously gone up and down a bit with various crises. And, and as we know, British public opinion is increasingly fickle, but it's, it's been pretty stable at around 70 percent. So from that point of view, um, there hasn't been a great deal of change um, over the, the Queen's reign when there's obviously been so much um, other change. I just wonder if you could um, just share your views, Ian, on this idea of the servant, uh, the servant queen, uh, the servant monarchy, and how important that has been in, um, first of all, uh, getting support from the public for the work she does and and then for her role and and how did that develop and how well formed is that and is that all is that basically uh something that comes out of a judeo-christian idea of monarchy yes very much so um there's a famous book by Frank Prochaska called The Welfare Monarchy, which argues that the British monarchy really reinvented and to some extent saved itself um, from Victorian times onwards, but particularly perhaps in the early 20th century, by becoming essentially a welfare monarchy, essentially uh, reaching out um, socially, um, you know, famously um, Edward VIII going round when he was Prince of Wales to, to the um, uh, unemployed um, in, in Wales saying this is appalling and, and the monarchy really putting itself at the position of being patrons of huge numbers of charities, working in the field of social welfare philanthropy. And that, of course, is, is very much what the monarchy does now. If you, if you look at the, the engagements of any member of the royal family, a huge number of them are to do with philanthropic institutions, charities. Um, and um, it is 
absolutely in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, the, the idea, of course, of Jesus redefining monarchy. Everyone thought uh, on um, Palm Sunday, you know, when he rode into Jerusalem, he was going to be the triumphant king. In fact, of course, he was going to his sacrificial death. And Jesus, the model that G Jesus gives us of the servant king, um, has been one that's been very much taken up by, by British monarchs in particular, not least the queen, who, as well as seeing herself, as I said, as, as having been anointed and to some extent set apart, also to some extent sees herself in that servant sacrificial role. I mean, I don't want to overdo the sacrificial side. I don't, she's not seeing herself as a sacrificial victim, although some of us might think that that in some senses is what the monarchy is now. But she does undoubtedly model herself because of her own faith on um, Jesus, uh, she's been very clear about that. And then if you go back to the, 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 the Jewish kings, the kings of Israel, the, the, the kings of the Hebrew Bible, the best of them, of course, were servant kings going back to David. And of course, Jesus is seen as coming of David's line. And, and the great Old Testament kings um, are, are, the best of them are, are servants. So it's, it's deep in that Judeo-Christian tradition. And I think this, this idea of the monarchy as, as a welfare monarchy, to use Prochaska's term, has, has been fundamental to our understanding of monarchy um, in the 20th century in Britain. And it's, it's replicated in many of the um, other European monarchies, although not quite to the same extent. So I think, yes, this idea of, of servanthood, of sacrifice, of sacrificing yourself uh, for, for the good of, of the nation, of involving yourself, if you like, in good works, in, in philanthropy, in charity, has been fundamental to the, the self-understanding of the British monarchy, of the way it's been presented uh, by, by the courtiers and, and the public relations people who sadly are now increasingly brought in to, to give it an image. And, and it's in a sense been a very successful image, and one could argue that it's, it's still got uh, a lot of currency in it. So as the monarch has withdrawn from the political sphere, um, you know, Victoria was still uh, intervening in some, some political issues, uh, very few, if any, 20th, uh, 21st century monarchs in Britain have, have actually taken a, a, a major political stance or, or a controversial stance. So as they've withdrawn from the political field, they have engaged more in this social action field, philanthropic field. So I think it's been crucial. Um, picking up what Ian said about the welfare monarchy, I think he's correct, but I think um, there is a problem for the future there just because of numbers. So the welfare monarchy has, has required the queen to be supported by members of the family, also engaging itself in these good works, um, being patrons of charities, going around opening NHS hospitals, whatever. And we now have a situation where many of the, um, the, 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 the what you might call the, the championship league um, of royals, um, the, the Kents, the Gloucesters, etc., are all um, pretty elderly themselves. Um, two have left the Premier League, Meghan and Harry, and, it, and Prince Philip's gone, etc., and the Queen will go too soon. And while Prince Charles has talked about um, that, that he would like the royal family to be reduced in numbers, and lots of people are approving of that because they think, oh, that's good because that means costs will go down. There will be an actual problem to maintaining this welfare monarchy um, because there just won't be the people around to do that. Um, there's going to be a, a, a considerable burden on the shoulders of very few key principles until the children of the Cambridges um, are old enough. That's quite some years ahead and who knows if they want to anyway. Um, Stephen, um, that's it, slim down monarchy. Um, Will, will that will that um, end this idea of the of uh, the welfare monarchy, and then uh, what will be the implications there? Would you like to just respond? Yes, I, I was just going to say I agree with Ian and Catherine about the welfare monarchy. Although um, the royal patronages uh, of charity and uh, various uh, public works, like opening hospitals and things was really a, a pragmatic solution uh, to what to do with Bertie, Queen Victoria's son, who um, was denied a role in, um, 
uh, any form of uh, formal part of the monarchy and so had to be given something to do and quite liked going on dinners and uh, tapping people up for money. Um, but I agree that uh, the motivation of the current um, monarchy and uh, uh, it, it has a, a deeper uh, and spiritual meaning to it as well, at least in her eyes. Uh, it is a problem. Um, the uh, royal family, as the Queen says, has to be seen to be believed and um, has to be publicly uh, obviously engaged in um, the life of the country. And uh, there was a time only a couple of years ago when it was thought that this was all going to be absolutely splendid because we had this interesting new participant uh, member of the monarchy uh, or the institution of the royal family, Meghan, um, coming from an entirely different background. Well, that hasn't worked out quite as people expected. Um, and part of what was hoped for for Harry and Meghan was that they would take up some of the burden of the patronages and the uh, royal visits and so on and so forth. Um, I don't think um, uh, Prince Andrew's daughters quite fit the bill in, in that sense. Um, and um, poor old William and Catherine are going to be um, spinning around the country like tops in order to take up some of the slack um, as um, the previous generation uh, are all entering their 70s and uh, into the sear and yellow. In a strange way, Jonathan, if I could bring you back, back here, this conversation about um, the, the, servant, uh, the servant king idea, the servant queen idea, um, which has um, uh, reinforced the monarchy and, and um, allowed people to become supportive of it. In a strange way, that's kind of a reversal of the discussion that faith has saved the monarchy. So the queen is there to defend the faith and the faith has saved the monarchy. I wonder if you have a reflection on that. Yes, uh, in fact, I was thinking more about the, um, uh, what uh, Stephen just mentioned about the uh, um, family issues, which then sort of plays into this soap opera we talked about. So it's not, it means that it's not just a drama. I think for a lot of people, they sort of feel that they can identify with the Queen, because on the one hand, yes, she is far away and distant and regal. On the other hand, you know, think of the problems she's had with her children and the adultery and the divorce or the business problems or the family rows. And, there's a, and, and, and on the one hand, she's distant. On the other hand, she's very imminent and they can, they can see themselves reflected almost and identify with the Queen. Um, and, and now you're getting people saying, oh, she's just like my grandmother, you know, using that stick and, and being wheeled around. And, and it's very curious how there's uh, this sort of thing going on. But the question that really intrigues me, I mean, we've all said that, you know, how her public servants, her, her faith, her commitment um, uh, and uh, stability. But I, I wonder what she's at, what influence she's had. In other words, what, what has actually changed as a result? Or what's going to go when she goes? That, um, because you know it, it's wonderful having her there um, as a figurehead. But what difference does it really, really matter in terms of the country? As, as I said earlier, her, her, her glorious example of faith hasn't actually encouraged people to be faithful. Um, uh, her values have they really permeated into the country at large? So yes, she's wonderful. But actually, what is her lasting influence? That's a very interesting point that Jonathan raises. And while it may be the case that as the, the extent to which the Queen's um, mentioning of religion, for example, in her Christmas messages has gone like that. Um, so the um, decline in the tents of the Church of England has gone like that the opposite way. But what we don't know is the extent to which her position at least reinforces people's view that the Church of England remains the church of the country um, that, that it that it that it still has a certain influence in people's lives. Can you tell us something about the um, time in 2012 when the, uh, wasn't there an event at Lambeth Palace where there was a suggestion that the Church of England should be re, re kind of um, uh, rethought re in a way? Yes. That it was, well, uh, this I thought was a very interesting 
um, speech that she gave at Lambeth Palace in 2012 to mark her Diamond Jubilee, where uh, she addressed um, faith leaders invited there by the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan, Rowan Williams. And uh, she, she gave a speech and said, uh, Anglicanism has a duty to protect the free practice of all other faiths in this country. While she also acknowledged that woven into the fabric of this country, the church, meaning the Church of England has helped build a better society. And it's, it struck me at the time that the, the Supreme Governor of the Church of England saying that Anglicanism has a duty to protect the free practice of all other faiths in this country was somewhat rewriting what the Church of England exi exists for. That certainly wasn't what it was created for. Um, but she, she was providing it with a particular uh, role in the 21st century um, in, in a country which is clearly much more diverse than it was at the beginning of her reign. Uh, and she was acknowledging um, the importance of those other faiths as well. Was that following what Prince Charles had, had said much earlier, that he wanted to be known as the defender of faiths rather than the faith? Well, he said defender of faith, singular, generic faith. It did, it did follow uh, what he had said. He made that remark in 1994. But uh, you could say that, that, that Prince Charles was following his mother because in 1952, um, when she gave her first Christmas message before her coronation, uh, the following June, she asked people, uh, whatever their faith was, to, to pray for her. She prepared for that coronation. And she also um, encouraged the, the involvement of other faiths in the Commonwealth Day service uh, at Westminster Abbey uh, at a time when Westminster Abbey itself wasn't so keen on the idea. So um, there has been a, a, a progression, a, a change in thinking, but it's involved both the Queen and the Prince of Wales, rather than one, one of you know, him, him taking the lead. And in fact, he has since um, retracted that and indicated that he, he does, he does, um, he does, he does well, acknowledge it should be defender of the faith. The the faith. faith. But, he, but he will mean something broader than that. So he'll, he use the same words, but the meaning for him will, will be will be broader. But on that point, um, Catherine, what happened after that uh, event at Lambeth Palace? Did the Anglican Church embrace this? That it in its idea that perhaps it should be an umbrella group for for all, or did it resist? It was a speech given by the Queen, but as you know. When she gives a, gives a speech like like that um, in, that involves her, her her engagement with another organisation or individual, that that speech is discussed. There was a, a toing and froing between Lambeth and and Buckingham Palace on that on that speech. So it didn't come as any surprise to Rowan Williams, um, and he clearly heartily approved of it. Um, but there since may be, then, there may be some in the Church of England since. Who, who who take a different view, but the, the the Church of England has, as Ian was saying earlier, has been engaged in in uh, interfaith uh, dialogue for for some time. Um, and, in, and I, but I think on that on that occasion, the Supreme Governor pointed the way ahead. I think actually the person who first um, conceived of this idea was, was Rowan Williams's predecessor, George Carey, who made a famous speech talking about the Church of England as a hospitable establishment. And, and so I don't think it's the Queen who initially proposes this. Carey, who doesn't get a very good press nowadays, was really the person who, who floated the idea of the Church of England as an umbrella for all faiths. I think, I think what's also relevant here is that certainly in research I did, it, it, perhaps about 10 years ago, and I don't know if it's still the same now, some of the most fervent royalists in Britain and also the most fervent defenders or 
proponents of the idea of Britishness as opposed to Englishness or Scottishness were ethnic and religious minorities. You would find in, in the um, Muslim, Jewish, Sikh and, and uh, in ethnic minorities, a much higher proportion of supporters for monarchy and also supporters for the idea of, of Britain and the United Kingdom than uh, among the, 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 the white, if you like, uh, indigenous population. Um, and, and I think that's very significant because as Catherine was saying, the, the, the Queen's particular outreach to um, minorities, both religious and ethnic, I think has, has paid off. And I think if we go back to um, Jonathan's very interesting question about the influence of the monarchy, I think possibly historians may come to say that we have perhaps ridden the whole uh, culture wars and, and, and uh, particularly perhaps Muslim um, issues uh, coming out of, of Islam better than certain other countries, for example, France, because of the role of the monarchy. Um, I, I come back, I mean, I'm very interested in putting this in a European context, because if you look at the countries that have monarchies in Europe, they tend to be, broadly speaking, politically the most stable, the, the Scandinavia, the Netherlands, whether you'd say this about Britain now, I'm not sure. But um, certainly, I think you could say that the influence of monarchy is has been on the whole towards stability. Um, and, and and I think in the in terms of potential flashpoints of of religion and and culture clashing, possibly possibly uh, the monarchy has has had some some influence. Um, I just also think I mean William's very interesting point. Uh, Jonathan, sorry, Jonathan remains point about us identifying with the Queen, perhaps particularly those of us of a certain age. If you think of the two defining images of the Queen in the last uh, two years, uh, the overwhelming one, which is, of course has been used so much in terms of party gate and everything recently, is of her sitting alone with her mask on in St George's Chapel, Windsor, at the funeral of her husband. And I mean, that image, I think, has seared itself uh, on, on many people's consciences. And of course, it was used shamelessly by the opposition when attacking Boris Johnson. Here is the Queen, not able to sit with anyone for her own husband's funeral, and there you are partying away. And the other image, I think, of her coming in um, on the arm of Prince Andrew to her husband's memorial service. Now, I took that as an extraordinarily significant spiritual gesture. It made me think of the prodigal son. Here is the queen welcoming back her erring prodigal son and, and in her own understated way showing that forgiveness. And, and that seems to me an act of supreme grace. Now, I don't think it was seen by that in the media, who, needless to say, uh, you know, spin it in a different way. But those two defining images of the queen in, in the last couple of years, sitting alone in St George's Chapel, Windsor, and coming in on the arms of her errant son, um, I think extraordinarily powerful and to me deeply spiritual images. I would agree with that and certainly that was the message I got with uh, Andrew, um, you know, this was the importance of, of family and forgiveness. Um, uh, by the way, we're talking about archbishops, I think we need to credit Archbishop Ramsey because he was the one that founded the Council of Christians and Jews uh, in the first place, so we need to push that <laughs> that impetus a little bit earlier. Um, but to uh, extend Ian's point a bit further about the harmony, it, it's very noticeable, it's not just harmony between the phase, but also within the phase. In other words, what's happened is that where groups are at war elsewhere in the country or elsewhere in the world, they haven't been here, um, and whether it's Sunnis and Shias, um, or, or for instance, Jews and Muslims, uh, you know, who are at odds in the Middle East, unfortunately, um, you know, actually we get on very well because we've sort of imbibed this culture of tolerance and understanding and dialogue. And that really has come from the top. I would like to talk about what happens next. Um, you used a phrase to me, Catherine, when we were speaking earlier, saying that she really has become the defender of Christianity. And in this conversation, we've heard about, um, the, well, you've said that while membership or attendance at the Anglican Church has gone down, um, you know, support for her as the kind of iconic Christian ha has gone up. What will happen, I wonder, to um, 
the established church in this country when um, Prince Charles uh, be be becomes king, um, will there be um, a real impact on numbers, attendance, uh, uh, um, affiliation to the church at that point? Because her influence is no longer there. Are you talking specifically about the, the next coronation or are you talking specifically about... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about when Prince Charles takes over as king. He takes over. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. I think I think the coronation will be an important moment for the Church of England. Um, it, people often talk about uh, the importance of the coronation for the monarchy, um, but but here we'll have uh, a Church of England involved in the crowning of the next monarch. And it's the Church of England in an era when the, the four different nations of the United Kingdom have become more disparate. Um, once upon a time, perhaps it wouldn't have mattered so much to people in Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland that the Church of England was crowning the monarch. But I think that might lead a, to quite a debate about it, it, its validity um, for them. And I think it will be a moment that reminds everybody that the, that the Church of England sees itself as you know, very much the church of the country. Um, does it still have any right to be seen like that, given the decline in numbers that Jonathan's been talking about? So I think the coronation could be as much a test for the Church of England as it might be for for the nation, because no doubt there will be people who uh, will engage in debate when that when that happens uh, about um, whether we should still have you know a monarchy, whether this should be a republic, etc. Um, it's going to, it's, it would take some quite some time and untangling to uh, change this country from a monarchy to a republic. I'm not sure the um, either the public. Um, support for that exists or the political will um, but I but I do think it will be a, a major moment for the Church of England it will be in the spotlight. Uh, Ruth I thought your question was more about what's going to happen in terms of daily worship and practice and and the support of the church itself and and although I think the uh, I think what's going to happen is that the the church will lose a very powerful ally in, in the in the in the figure of the Queen but actually her, her death won't make any difference to whether people go on a Sunday or not, that the church will stand or fall on its own merits and whether its theology appeals to people. I would agree completely with Jonathan. Uh, on the coronation, I, I don't really agree with Catherine because all the conversations I've had, and I have been involved in some at quite a high level, suggest that there will be a, a very ecumenical uh, breadth to the next coronation. Um, church of Scotland, of course, was involved in the last one, the moderator, and will be involved. The Roman Catholic Church will be involved. Other denominations will be involved. And there will also almost certainly be a, a, a separate ceremony. The coronation will remain a Christian um, ceremony uh, spearheaded by the Church of England, but with much more involvement by other um, Christian churches uh, than, than in, in 1953. The, there will also almost certainly be a, a, a second um, uh, ceremony, possibly in Westminster Hall, which will involve other faiths, non-Christian faiths, and, and indeed representatives of the community. And there will also almost certainly be what we had in medieval times, which will be a kind of showing of the monarchy and possibly uh, ceremonies replicating almost the coronation in Edinburgh, uh, in Belfast and in Cardiff and probably also in the north of England. So it's going to be much less Church of England centred. I think that's absolutely sure the next coronation and much less Anglo-centred. I think, I mean, Catherine makes a very valid point about the fact that the United Kingdom is, is, is much more fragmented and potentially, of course, going to fragment than it was in 1953. And it's, it's of course, no secret that, that in Scotland there is less support for the monarchy than, than in England. Um, and, and obviously what may happen in Ireland is, is going to be crucial in, in all this, the possibility of United Ireland 
and and, and what that means. Um, so so the, the, there are a lot of issues, but I, I think the next coronation is going to be much more ecumenical. But I, I also absolutely agree with Jonathan. I don't think the change of monarch is going to have much of an impact on, on people's church going habits or faith. I think we'll continue to see probably decline in the in the mainstream churches and we'll probably continue to see a rise in the in the more uh, evangelical charismatic churches i mean these these trends are deeply set now and i don't think that the monarch's uh, personality or change or faith is going to make any difference to that not no indeed really whether we have a monarchy or not these are these are separate questions i think i wasn't suggesting it was going to be wholly anglican um i i agree i agree with with Ian, that, that, that there is going to be the involvement of others, but in a way that there wasn't, apart from the moderator in 1953. But I do think that the Church of England is still going to be in pole position, and they're not going to give that up very easily. No, although, as you know, Catherine, there are huge debates in the Church of England and many within it who, who would like to see the Church of England disestablished, who would like to see the, the end of the, the monarch as supreme governor. So, you know, I think there's, there's, a, there's a big move in the, in the Church of England to, towards disestablishment and, and towards um, uh, distancing themselves from that or, or that lot who are unhappy with that, that notion. I, I, I don't, I mean, I agree that, that the coronation may focus this, this a bit, but... Um, I'm not sure it's a kind of crunch moment for the Church of England. Maybe, maybe it is. This new information you've given us there, Ian, about the Westminster Hall event and the replica events in various uh, nations of the United Kingdom, yeah, that, that's new to me. Um, what kind of uh, groups have been discussing these? Well, Where well there have been ongoing uh, discussions at a high level for, for many years um, in, in both court circles and church circles, and I don't think it's any secret. I mean, I and others have published about this for, for many years. This is the way I think the thinking is going. I mean, I, I you know, I'm not privy to any um, discussions at the moment, and I wouldn't be able, obviously, to talk about them even if I was. But my sense, my strong sense, is there there is a feeling that there will be that the coronation, as I say, will remain a Christian service, um, and and in Westminster Abbey, um, and and as, as Catherine says, the Church of England will will have the key role, or I think a much much less of a, a exclusive role than it had in 1953. But I think there is a general. Uh, acceptance in in both the, the the court and church and other circles that there will be some other kind of ceremony which which will bring in other faith leaders and and um, community leaders and I think there's also a strong expectation that we're going to have something that moves round the country uh, for very obvious reasons in the in the current situation but obviously all of this uh, is, is still you know it, it's it's being discussed about the, the um, often not not um, made very public, but but I think this is this is probably generally accepted as the way where we're we're going to go. We need to finish now in the next few moments, but I wonder if I could ask you all um, to to just uh, make some kind of comment on um, her contribution and how uh, and her legacy. If you could sum it up in a in a phrase. Um, how would you do that? I wonder if I, perhaps Jonathan goes to you first. What strikes me is she's always sending out uh, greetings cards to people on the 100th birthday. I very much hope she'll send herself one. Uh, <laughs> well, I should extend that because there's a Jewish tradition of whenever there's um, uh, a special event, you say, may you live to 120. And who knows, she might even get there. <laughs> Thank you. I think we could end it there, actually. That's a lovely, lovely way of ending the, the whole hour. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you to all the panellists today. Um, so this recording will be going up on our YouTube um, uh, site very soon and with a report on the website. And I hope you enjoy the Jubilee uh, weekend. Thank you very much for joining us.